Hey everybody, welcome to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse celebrates the web slinger's storied history by packing in dozens of references to the films, comics, TV shows, and video games. And we're going to break all of them down for you right now. And warning, as always, big spoilers for Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse are ahead. The movie begins with the approval of the Comics Code Authority on screen. Following public protests against comics in the 1950s, the Comics Code Authority was invented to let young readers and parents know if a comic book was family friendly. Using this stamp at the front of the film is just one way the movie is like a comic book come to life. After Miles gets his powers, onomatopoeia sound effects keep appearing on screen, like a comic and the animation is highlighted with Ben Day dots. This was an old school coloring method that used several small dots to give the illusion of a full color book. The film also employs split screens to mimic comic book panels. Director Ang Lee tried this technique in the 2003 Hulk film, but it flows much nicer here, inspired by the split screened action of anime. Peter Parker begins by narrating the film the way he narrated Sam Raimi's original Spider-Man. Who am I? You sure you wanna know? Every time Peter retells the origin, he always says, Let's do this one more time. And this is a fun reference to Sony's propensity for retelling Spider-Man's origin, giving us three different Peter Parkers in a single decade. Many scenes in the flashback reference previous films and comics, such as the train rescue and Peter's lunch with Mary Jane in Spider-Man 2, Peter kissing upside down, and this scene. We also hear the theme from the 1960s cartoon, a reference to Spidey's breakfast cereal, and at one point, Spider-Man takes a pose much like the MCU Peter Parker trying to hold together the Staten Island Ferry. We also see the cover of Amazing Fantasy 15, the first appearance of Spider-Man, and Amazing Spider-Man 42, Birth of a Hero. Now this could be a reference to Miles becoming the new Spider-Man, but 42 also appears several times throughout the movie, once even as numbers from a sign that have fallen on the ground. There could be a lot of reasons for this. It could be a reference to The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where 42 is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Or it could be a tribute to Jackie Robinson or Lewis Carroll, who often used 42 in his books. Let me know what you think 42 means in the comments below. Miles is watching a video in class made by the corporation Alchemax, which is owned by Wilson Fisk. Alchemax is in the comics, first appearing in Spider-Man 2099, but later appearing in the current timeline owned by Spidey's ex, Liz Allen. The narrator in the video calls multiple universes a what if to infinity, and this references a couple of Marvel comics. The first is, of course, the Infinity Gauntlet series, which was loosely adapted into the movie Infinity War. The other is the anthology series, What If, where every issue would focus on our heroes in some twisted version of the Marvel universe. There's another point where older Peter says, what the, a comedy comic that Marvel published in the 80s and 90s. Miles has to complete a book report on the Charles Dickens novel, Great Expectations, and this has a few meanings. In that novel, a young orphan boy meets an escaped convict while visiting the graves of his family. This parallels Miles visiting Peter's grave when he encounters the other Peter Parker, who, in a way, has escaped from his original reality. But expectations is a running theme in the film and it pops up again and again. It's the graffiti that Miles tags before he's bitten by the spider. And it even symbolizes that Miles has to live up to the expectations of all the spider people who have come before him. But the movie also constantly subverts our expectations. When Miles is bitten by the spider, there's no dramatic moment, he just swats it away. Instead of bravely jumping off a roof, as we've seen Spider-Man do several times before, he finds a smaller building instead. But also, this movie has to live up to the expectations of fans, who scrutinize every frame and compare it to previous films. For instance, when older Peter falls down, he says, I hurt my back, which references this scene in Spider-Man 2. <laughs> which is in turn a reference to Tobey Maguire almost not filming Spider-Man 2 because of a back injury he sustained while filming Seabiscuit. And he was almost replaced by Jake Gyllenhaal, who is set to play the villain Mysterio in the upcoming Spider-Man Far From Home. Quite a few of the contacts in Miles' phone are Easter eggs. B. Bendis and S. Pichelli are references to Brian Michael Bendis and Sarah Pichelli, creators of Miles Morales. Another name in the phone is S. Ditko, which stands for Steve Ditko, who co-created Spider-Man with Stan Lee, who, of course, has a cameo as a store owner selling Spider-Man costumes. His store makes a point of saying no refunds, which reminds me of another famous shop owner. This magazine you sold me isn't Fantastic Four. It's Fantastic Floor. Sorry, no refunds. When the other Spider people appear, they're all drawn in styles that match their original comics, particularly Spider-Gwen and Spider-Man Noir. And Spider-Man Noir is voiced by longtime comic book fan and former Ghost Rider Nicolas Cage. There's another Marvel vet in the voice cast, Mahershala Ali, formerly Cottonmouth in Luke Cage and now The Prowler. 
and his character, Aaron Davis, was also played by Donald Glover in Spider-Man Homecoming, where he hinted that Miles Morales might someday appear in the MCU. I don't want those weapons in this neighborhood. I got a nephew who live here. And there's one more Marvel vet in the cast. The Kingpin is voiced by Liev Schreiber, who played Sabretooth in X-Men Origins Wolverine. Jake Johnson voices the older Peter, and comedian John Mulaney voices Peter Porker, the spectacular Spider-Ham. There's a billboard for Mulaney's Broadway show, Oh Hello, in Times Square. And another billboard is for a restaurant called Ramita Ramen, a reference to iconic Spider-Man artist John Ramita, and possibly his son, John Ramita Jr. When the scientists tap the dimensional gateway, several universe numbers appear on a computer screen. In all Marvel stories, each universe is assigned a number. The traditional comics, for example, are numbered 616 and the Marvel Cinematic Universe is numbered Earth-199-999, etc. In Spider-Verse, each number on the screen actually does correspond to that character's number in the comic books. When all of the spider people finally meet up, they follow Aunt May into the late Peter spider cave. The secret layer hidden in his home is a reference to Spider-Man and his amazing friends. And the layer is filled with Easter eggs. There's the Spider-Mobile, which was a useless gift from the Human Torch in the comics, and all of the Spidey suits have appeared in some media before, including the spider armor, the big time suit, the iron spider, and the suit from the new video game. What spider suits did you spot? Let me know in the comments below. In the final fight against the Kingpin, Miles briefly stands on the top of the Brooklyn Bridge. And this is an important location in Spider-Man lore because it's where the Green Goblin killed Gwen Stacy. The note that Miles leaves on the Kingpin is a callback to Spider-Man's tendency for labeling his good deeds for people to find later. And finally, in the post credit scene, we're introduced to Spider-Man 2099, voiced by Oscar Isaac. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first. But instead of joining the main fight, he ends up in the 60s cartoon, reenacting this famous meme. Well, that's all the Easter eggs we found, but how about you? Please let us know in the comments below. For Screen Crush, I've been Ryan Airy. Thanks for watching.